Hello and welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Gabriel suffered unimaginable torture. His body was robbed of the necessities it needed to grow and become strong. He was bullied, ridiculed, starved, and beaten until there was nothing left for his captors to take. In his early years, he lived in homes that showed him love, nurturing him to be a kind, sweet boy who only wanted one thing in life, his mother's love. In the last eight months of his life, that love he grew to know was ripped from his heart and replaced with the hateful words of his mother's voice forever echoing in him. Today, we will learn the fate of those who ignored his cries, ignored the signs, who never thought twice about the physical and emotional impact they had on this young boy's life. Instead of sorrow and remorse from his tormentors, we see only the guilt of throwing one too many punches, the guilt of getting caught. Warning. Today's episode depicts graphic details of child abuse, torture, and some strong language. If you feel this may be too much for you, I encourage you to skip this podcast or ask someone to listen with you or for you. Last week, I introduced you all to Gabriel Fernandez, and we looked at the last eight months of his life as he was systematically tortured by his mother and her boyfriend, eventually leading to the fatal beating on May 22nd, 2013, that claimed his life on May 24th, 2013. It was a hard podcast to listen to. There was, there was a lot of abuse and we don't know the half of it. Um, you can't report everything. You can't find everything. Because in the end, not everything was documented. We can only go off the testimonies of uh, adults who came forth and spoke up for Gabriel and tried to get help for him. Only to have their cries unheard. And today I'm going to introduce you to his mother, Pearl, her boyfriend, Osario. And we're going to look at the aftermath of Gabriel's death. Gabriel's mother is Pearl Cynthia Fernandez. She was born August 29th, 1983. Her parents are Robert and Sandra Fernandez. And in Pearl's early life, she would have very little interaction with her dad as he was incarcerated on and off through her childhood. She would claim that her mother, Sandra, didn't love her and would abuse her as a child. And she would reveal this during an interview with a clinical psychologist after her arrest for Gabriel's murder. It should be noted that neither Robert or Sandra have came out since this has been made public, denying or confirming these allegations. And honestly, I think that's the best thing they can do for their family. I think that When you look at Pearl and you look at her as a whole, as everything that's happened to her and everything that she has done to others, it's really hard to watch her give an interview saying these things. You know, I had a tough childhood and because of that tough childhood, I passed that on to my son. To me, it looks like she's decided that if she passes the guilt on to something like a difficult childhood it means that the judgment that the nation is giving her is shifted with it and she has lied throughout most of her life if not her entire life just to get her way pearl was somebody who wanted it her way wanted it done during her time and if you didn't do it or didn't do it her way then she would punish you. And she would punish you by abuse, either verbal or physical, or she would abuse you by taking things away from you if she had control to do so. Like with her parents, when they upset her, they weren't allowed to see Gabriel or the other two children. 
most would call Pearl's interaction with her children animalistic. But even the animals know that you don't kill your young. Pearl had a really hard time with her education growing up. Um, she would make it to the eighth grade, but in 2011, there was a cognitive ability test given and she would end up scoring in the third percentile, which is equivalent to a second grade student. And it would be, it would be something like this that clinical psychologists would look at to determine whether or not what she did was to Gabriel was something she comprehended the, the consequences of. They, they try to say that she was unable to comprehend that this action caused this reaction because of her cognitive abilities. Pearl tried in school. She wasn't a student who just didn't want to go. She attempted to be a good student, but she had a learning disability that prevented that. And she grew up in a time where learning disabilities were not easily identified. They were not tested for, um, they were not accepted. She also grew up during that time where no children were supposed to be left behind. So instead of addressing the issues they were seeing with Pearl, they would just simply pass her on, which is how she ended up to the eighth grade with her peers, but her level of thinking was six years younger. And in the eighth grade, uh, Pearl would eventually drop out of school, believing that she would never need her education in her life. Pearl would claim that she would be just nine years old the first time that she abused alcohol and drugs. And at nine years old, you're still very much a concrete thinker. You don't, you don't have the abilities to critically think the situation that if I consume this alcohol, this will change. She just did it. And of course, her drug of choice wasn't simply pot, as most would say. It wasn't crack. It wasn't cocaine. It was methamphetamines. And at nine years old, when you take such an addictive and mind-altering drug, you have forever changed the course of your brain's development. So I would say that some of her education difficulties would come from the fact that at nine years old, which would be just about where you're at coming out of third grade, she's already has these, these deficits present in her intellect. Pearl would run away from her home at 11 years old. Now, I find it very hard to believe that an 11 year old would run away and never come home. And we know this because typically if you're running away at 11 years old, never to return, there's not really a relationship with your family. But it's been evident that Pearl did have a relationship with her family. It was her family that came to her and said, give us Gabriel and we'll raise him. We know you don't want him. We know you don't love him. So we'll take him. And she made the best decision she could have ever made by giving Gabriel to her uncles for them to raise and love. And then eventually her parents would receive custody. And again, they would raise him and love him like he was their own. Pearl claims that by the time she was in her teens, she had been sexually assaulted more than one time. One of these assaults alleged that her uncle had molested her. Again, Pearl's family has not came out confirming or denying the allegation, and I think that's wise on their part as well. And it's not that I'm saying that I don't believe Pearl. It's not that. She probably was sexually ass assaulted. Now, whether the person she's pointing the finger to is truly the person, there's where I'm having a hard time believing. Simply put, I don't think I've ever seen a moment where Pearl was truthful in any interview that she's done, in any videotape that's been played of her. I think she, at this point in life, lies because it's the only thing she knows how to do. And therefore, I don't know what the truth looks like when she says the truth. So if her uncle molested her, it makes it really hard for somebody looking at the picture as a whole 
and at her history of being a liar and then readily uh, believing that her uncle played a part in something in her childhood that changed the way she would be as an adult. She'd also claimed that there were some men that kidnapped her and held her hostage for days as they repeatedly taking turns to rape her. There was no evidence of this. Pearl never went for any sexual assault and had a rape kit done. As far as I'm aware, there have been no charges brought against anybody for the alleged sexual assault. But again, I say, when you're looking at the picture as a whole, I'm not dismissing her as being a victim. I'm having a hard time believing the story. And that makes it very difficult for anybody to believe anything that she says. Pearl's unstable childhood and teenage years would lead to mental health professionals diagnosing her with several mental disabilities. She would be diagnosed as a depressed disorder, and that is just your, your run-of-the-mill chronic depression. She would be diagnosed with developmental disability, which again, reverting back to that cognitive testing, she very much had. They also diagnosed her with a possible personality disorder and possibility of post-traumatic stress disorder. Pearl put herself in a life that was very dark at a very young age. Nine is far too young for you to live the life that you do when you are abusing drugs and breaking the law. And you don't, you don't understand those consequences. You don't understand what being a part of that life creates for you. And so, in the end, Pearl suffered. And the things she went through would play out in the way she handled things later in life through her PTSD. Again, you know, with her, because of her history of not telling the truth, it's really, really hard to look at Pearl and, and believe what she's saying. She doesn't come off as a person who is truthful, first of all. Um, second of all, it's not so much as she's telling you a story as it is she's telling you this is how it is. And the way the tone difference makes, you know, it just adds to the unbelievability of what she says. I think that she is quick to pull the wool over the sheep's eyes, so to say, and she figures out how to twist and manipulate the person she's talking to. And this plays a huge role throughout, you know, her years as a parent because she's able to manipulate DCFS into believing what she is saying is true and what her children are saying is incorrect. And I think she's smarter than just school education. She has some street smarts that's far beyond most of our street smarts. Most of us are not smart enough to pull off some of the things she has. Uh, Pearl's children, which I'm only able to find one article that says there's more than, more than the Gabriel, his older brother and older sister, who all lived in the home with Pearl in 2013 when Gabriel was being abused. I found one article that said she had another daughter and another son. I have not found that confirmed anywhere else. So I'm going to retract what I was saying last week about multiple ch children and just talk about the ones that I'm for sure know she has. And that would be Gabriel's older brother and Gabriel's older sister. All three children would have the same father of Arnold Contreras. Arnold and Pearl were together in her young adult life where she would become the mother of these three children before their relationship would not work for them and they would split ways. Now Arnold, Gabriel's real dad, would be in and out of incarceration throughout most of his life, including the night of the fatal beating. However, Pearl would say during her interview that Arnold and other romantic partners, including Osario, were very abusive to her. But her family has come out and said that if anybody is being abusive in the relationship, it's Pearl. So 
I'm not saying that e any of the men that she dated never raised a hand or never emotionally abused Pearl, but I am saying that she's not as innocent as she portrays herself to be. But I would say that Pearl's not as innocent as she claims to be. She's not the poor, pitiful victim that she paints this picture of. Pearl's family is very open with the abusive personality that she has. And they're quick to jump to defend others, saying that she would be abusive. And that includes Osario. Osario, by any means, is not without blood on his hands. He very much is. He played a big part in this, but I think Pearl was able to manipulate him to do what she couldn't either bring herself to do or she could. She didn't have the physical strength to do. Pearl currently has charges pending against her with Arnold Contreras in the form of she threatened him with a knife. She has a pending assault family violence case against her. At the time of my research, it still had not gone to court. So we're still waiting to see that outcome. At this point, we know it's not like she needs, she's ever going to have an opportunity to get out and adding more time to her sentence wouldn't change. Pearl has been reported prior to Gabriel of abuse and neglect older son and the daughter. Prior to her having custody of Gabriel, there were 35 DCFS allegations against her, and each allegation was something subtle. Like with the oldest one, there was an abuse case opened when they were in a minor car accident, and the older son, he ended up getting injured in a way that if he would have had a seatbelt on, he wouldn't have been injured. There's also another claim that she was abusing him. But DCFS would later come in and close this claim saying the complaint was unfounded. And if it's anything about what we know DCF is, DCFS is capable of do, doing like he, they did with Gabriel's case, there wasn't a thorough investigation done, not in my opinion. In 2007, five years prior to Gabriel's abuse, Pearl was once again filed on by her own family saying she was neglecting to feed her daughter. Nothing ever comes of this claim either. 35 allegations were reported with the DCFS where Pearl is the abuser and her children are the victim and nothing ever comes of that. I think it's baffling that somebody could have such an extensive history and none of those claims ever going anywhere. I can understand maybe one or two false claims being made against a person simply as a vendetta, but 35, to me, that says there's something more to the picture that we're not seeing. But DCFS never went in and, and thoroughly investigated this, so she, she remained, I mean, she had custody of, of the older two, and in 2012, she gained custody of Gabriel. So, to me, there shows a crack in the system that Pearl's kids, unfortunately, have fallen through time and time again. I'm going to introduce you to Isario, Tony, as he was also known, a Gary. He was born June 13th, 1980. He was raised by a family where his mother and his father didn't have a great education. However, they knew the value of family and they worked very hard to make sure that their children never went hungry and that they had the things they needed. It may not have been the best of the best, but they were raised to take care of their family. Unfortunately, Asario never shows us that side. His family, for the most part, I mean, we, we know a little bit about his mother, we know a little bit about his father, but we don't know a whole lot about his family. They have managed to kind of stay in the background when their son soared to infamy with this case. Usually, people can uncover some of the, the strangest things about a person. But in Asario's case, his, his early life is sparse. 
But what is there is a lot of positive feedback regarding him. Asario would also have troubles through his educational career. He would repeat two grades, one being his junior year. He would be 19 years old trying to pass into his senior year before giving up and dropping out of high school. And dropping out of high school isn't as taboo as it once was because now you have the ability to go get your GED and or you can go back to high school at any age and get your high school diploma. Now because we have the GED, it keeps those fields of professions opened up for those who never actually went through the traditional graduation. And for Tony, in his early 20s, he would find work at an assisted living facility in Woodland Hills. And his supervisor, she had amazing things to say about him and his personality. He was very kind. He was known to be very caring. He was very patient with the residents here. And Asario's job was to drive the residents to and from appointments or to the market or wherever they were going that day. And it was nothing new for Asario to go to his supervisor and ask if he could take a longer route that would be more scenic than the traditional route from the facility to wherever they were going and back. He cared enough about what his residents were seeing that he would often asked to change the route so that there was something different to look at for the passengers. And that, that comes from a person who cares deeply. That's not, that's not a show. You don't, if you are capable of selling that, you're probably making a lot of money as an actor and not a driver for a assisted living facility. So I don't think that was an act on Tony's part. I think genuinely, this is who he was. He would later get a job working through AVL private security. He'd be a security guard down at the Velarda market. And this would be during his time that he would be with Pearl and also when Gabriel would be living with them. It was a good job for him to have, especially in their neighborhood. And it was a step up from what he was doing. And he had, a, he had an opportunity to really show people his compassion. But he got with Pearl and then things started changing. He convinced her to take custody of Gabriel again to get more of welfare assistance. That doesn't sound like the person who worked for the assisted living place that his employer had testified about. That doesn't sound like the same person to me. So I don't know if there's a change because of the abuse that Pearl was dishing out, or maybe it was the collaboration of the two, uh, them getting together and it just being a very toxic relationship for both parts. It could, it could be a combination of any of that. But in that time, Osario went from this compassionate, caring person to a monster who took the life of a child that was not biologically his. Although, I mean, Gabriel's older brother and older sister would also be subjected to some abuse and some neglect during the time that Gabriel was there. But Osario and Pearl singled out Gabriel. And the thing about Osario singling him out was the coincidence in the fact that Pearl never wanted Gabriel in the first place. So for Osario to single him out and, and he would bear the brunt of the abuse from Osario really probably made Pearl feel validated in the fact that she did not like this child and there's a reason why. Not the fact that he's a sweet boy who was raised to be loving and most eight-year-olds, no matter whether they're a boy or a girl, they're very in touch with their emotions. And Pearl and Osario would see this as him being gay. This is something that is a continuation. Like it was almost like you're gay, so we're going to hit you with the baseball bat. Or you're acting gay, so you can wear a dress to school today. You know, it, it was almost their reason for the abuse that they subjected him to. And regardless of what you thought the child's sexual orientation was, he's still a child. He's still eight years old. And you hitting him with a baseball bat like you're trying to smack the ball out of the park, they don't 
go together. You should not have raised that baseball bat to anyone. But you damn sure should not have raised it to an eight-year-old child. On May 22nd, 2013, that night, Asario would describe his emotion during the time of the beating as enraged. He was angry because he felt like this child may have stood a chance in separating him and Pearl. Gabriel had told his mother, innocently, asked her, why do you stay if he hurts you? And Pearl took it and repeated it to Asario in probably a far negative light than it was originally casted in. So Asario did not see, it was an innocent comment that he didn't really understand what that meant if she was to leave the situation. He didn't take it like that. He took it as this, this kid's driving a wedge between me and the love of my life. I've got to do something. I've got to defend my relationship. And he lost his temper and took a child from this earth that he had no right of taking. On May 22nd, the night of the fatal beating in Osario and Pearl's home, as first responders were trying to resuscitate the child and get a pulse and get him breathing, LA County Sheriff's deputies were there and they had a few questions because the story that they were told as to why first responders had to come in the first place was not adding up to Gabriel's appearance. Gabriel, I looked at these photos and they're horrendous to look at. They're awful. I mean, you look and your eyes can't just pick one injury. They bounce around the page and you don't realize that you are looking at the face of a little boy because you are just trying to figure out what all of these marks and bruises and swelling is from. LA County Sheriff's deputies would get with a Gary and ask him why Gabriel's appearance, why did he look this way? And Osario, he would call him gay and he would say that Gabriel was a liar. But he also said that the boy was an angry child and he would hurt himself a lot. He would also go on to say that just a couple days prior, he was in a bicycle accident. When looking at those pictures and hearing the word bicycle accident, I don't see how that's anywhere close to being believable. And that, to me, that's funny that they thought, that, that Osario thought, you know, say he fell off his bike and that's why he looks so bad. He's so bruised up. And then tonight he just hit his head on the cabinet and went unconscious. Those don't add up even when you mesh them together. They do not add up in Gabriel's appearance. And so this, this ruffled some feathers with those deputies, but they would also go on and talk to Pearl and see what she had to say. Now, Pearl... As a mother, should those two words should never be used together again because she couldn't care less. Her son was, his chest was being pumped on by grown men trying to start his heart again. They are pushing medication and wrapping wounds and stabilizing his neck so that they can get him to a hospital where there are people who are further trained than what they are and she couldn't care. She really could not. She, I mean, she would look past the people trying to ask her questions. She would just look at them b blankly in the face. She could not care. And the deputies, it was very apparent on her face. She didn't care. But she would show emotion to the fact that they wanted to talk to them. And that that meant the family's seven cats would have to be caged up while they're gone. And that worried her. I am the mother of a fur baby. Um, our little dog is my family's pride and joy. However, if one of my children are being worked on in the manner that Gabriel was being worked on, my last concern would be on our family dog. Because there's food and water. I'll come get you when this is settled, that's my child. And I'm getting into the back of that ambulance, whether any of you people like it or not, because that's my baby you are working on, regardless of their age. That's where I'm going to be. And Pearl 
over here, mother of the year, worried about her cats. Her priorities are not there. And some of you are probably arguing in there and you're saying, well, you know, Pearl has all these mental diagnoses now and we kind of understand her way of thinking. Even with her diagnosis that she now has from mental health care providers, I'm still calling it as bullshit. Simply for the fact that you could look at that scene and have no idea what a paramedic is, have no idea what a police officer is, have no idea the situation at all, and you would be concerned for the person that they are pushing on with all their might, just in a steady beat. That is without knowing any pretext, any definition, anything about this situation, just walking up because you don't know anything and you look at that and you can read the stress coming off of that situation. So for Pearl to react the way she did, that was just simply not caring. That wasn't a deficit. That wasn't a mental problem. That was somebody who did not care. Pearl will bring out the most sacred phrase today, which is blow me away. If you had not listened to last week's episode, I could not say this enough because those are the words that automatically come to my mouth when I read things like her not caring that her child is unresponsive and has no pulse. Blows me away that she could not care. She didn't give a rat's ass what was going on. But if it had to do with her cats, she was quick to step up and say something. On May 23rd, 2013, Asario would be interviewed three different times in a 24 hour period. And detectives, when they testified, they would note that it was readily apparent that at the beginning of these interviews, Asario was clamped up. He was being dishonest. He wouldn't tell the whole story. So they would sit and talk with him and get him to open up and slowly and slowly he would start admitting more and more. Initially, he told them of what Pearl had said that Gabriel had said to her. And he told them that because he made that statement, he spanked him. Again, those injuries and the story do not match up. However, they would continue pressing and ask him, you know, what's his relationship like with the kids? And he would say that it was good. As a matter of fact, nobody knew they were his stepchildren unless they were part of the family. To anybody looking in, they were his sons and his daughter. He referred to them as my sons and my daughter. He would also go on to say to the detectives about Gabriel and him being a difficult child quote unquote with that. Again, even the most difficult child would not m need to be punched or slapped or hit or humiliated in order to get some kind of structure from them. But Astario thought if I tell them that, you know, Gabriel just wouldn't mind, maybe they would see where I'm coming from. I don't know. Detectives would ask Asario what had happened that night that led to Gabriel being hospitalized. And again, he would say, well, this is what Pearl said that he had asked about why she stays with me when I, if I hurt her. And it just made me angry. So I spanked him. But then we would get this interview. Detective, so exactly what happened? Cold, hard facts. A Gary, I just hit him. Detective, you just hit him? A Gary, I hit him. Hit him over the head. Detective, did you? Okay, and what did you hit him in the head with? A Gary, my fist. Detective, your fist. 
And how many times? A Gary. Maybe ten times? Detective. Maybe ten times with your fists to the head. A Gary. To the head, yeah. Plus another ten times with my hand open. Detective. Okay, so tell me about when you would pick him up, hit him, knock him down, pick him up, and do it again. Okay, how many times did you do that? Pick him up, knock him down, and pick him up. A Gary. Four or five times. Detective. Four or five times. The shock that came from the the just language of the detective when he said that I could not even on a great day mimic that shock from learning that he was picking the child up hitting him so hard that he would fall down and then he would pick him back up and do it again. And Gary would admit also during the interviews that he hit Gabriel harder than he's ever hit anyone before. Now let's, let's backtrack just a minute. Gabriel stands four foot nine. He is 59 pounds. Four foot one, 59 pounds. He's a very tiny child. He's very low on the height and weight percentile for his age because of the abuse he was getting from home. A Gary, on the other hand, stood six foot two. He weighed 270 pounds. Even if a Gary just hit Gabriel one time as hard, if not harder than anybody he's ever hit before, that would have caused so much damage to that child that he may not have been able to come back from with just the one hit to his head. That would have done so much damage. But instead, Asario was enraged and fearful of losing his relationship. He hits him at least 20 times in the head, harder than he's ever hit anyone before, before saying he lost count. But he also admits to hitting Gabriel 20 times in the body before he loses count. That is 40 hits that night that we know of. There could be more. A 270 pound, six foot two man hit a four foot one, 59 pound, eight year old 40 times. My God, how the medical professionals were ever able to get a pulse back from him. The pain he had to be in just so his heart could beat. It's gut-wrenching. After Gary admits to hitting Gabriel, he is arrested for the attempted murder of eight-year-old Gabriel. And he does not have a bond. And very right so. Pearl is then arrested, and she's arrested for felony child endangerment and abuse. She does get a bond of $100,000. On May 28, 2013, four days after they remove Gabriel from life support, Asario and Pearl are charged with one count of first-degree murder with the special circumstance of torture. The arraignment was supposed to happen that day, but something inside the court proceedings slowed it down and they were not arraigned on these charges until June 11th. On May 29th, 2013, Gabriel's death triggers LA County to dig into their DCFS division. They're looking at four social workers, just that these people had a, had a hand at some point in the eight months that Gabriel lived with Asario and Pearl, these four people had interaction with the family. On May 29, 2013, Gabriel's death triggers LA County to probe DCFS. Four social workers are placed on desk duty pending possible disciplinary action 
as a result of Gabriel's death. I'm going to introduce you to the four people who were with the DCFS department and had a hand in investigating the allegations of abuse on Gabriel. Stephanie Rodriguez, if you remember, she was our point of contact with Gabriel's teacher last episode um, when she first decided to call DCFS on October 30th of 2012. Stephanie was part of the emergency response team and her job was to go out when a call came into the hotline she would go out and do a she'd be first on scene she'd be first to see the child she'd be first to evaluate the case and the allegation as credible it is said by a colleague that this is not a position for somebody who is new to dcfs and that's exactly what stephanie was she was new to DCFS and the department. She was not trained appropriately to see the signs that she should have been looking for. However, she is the one that would report haphazardly a body chart. And for those of you who don't know what a body chart is, it's, it's where caseworkers document signs of abuse when they are evaluating the child or talking to the child or have laid eyes on the child. They are to be marking down Every mark, every bruise, every healed scar, whatever. That way, when you do a comparison of the charts throughout the time, you can see, well, that injury that's healed now wasn't on the body chart from the last visit. So that's something new. And had everybody who investigated Pearl Fernandez done a body chart, there would have been an obvious increase in injuries to Gabriel. Co-workers would describe Stephanie as gullible and easily manipulated. And that's exactly what Pearl saw when Stephanie knocked on her door and told her that she had been reported for an allegation of abuse. Pearl knew just from talking to her for a minute that she could tell Stephanie whatever she wanted to and she would take her at her word. This was Pearl's profession is to be a credible liar and that way she could continue doing what she was doing at home and nobody would be the wiser this next worker i have a really hard time with um, her name is patricia clement and she's done a few interviews since the allegation came out against her and the charges were brought up as she never has the same story twice. Never. In all of her recounts of the case of Gabriel and the allegation and the investigation, it's never the same story twice. She changes it depending on who is the person interviewing her. When she was doing an internal investigation with Gabriel's case, Pearl would describe Gabriel as acting out in school rude to the teachers, and just an angry child. She would write this into the report, but she never contacted school officials. Had she called and spoke to somebody at the school, there would have been a different story and questions and flags should have been raised because the school would have said, we are the ones contacting y'all because he is being abused. These are the stories he is telling us when he comes to school and his face is riddled with little bruises from being shot with a BB gun. You know, he asked, is it normal to get a spanking with the buckle end of a belt? No, that's not normal. No. But she would write this up in her investigation. She would also write that Asario is an upstanding and caring adult with no criminal history. And she's not wrong in this statement. She's not. Asario, up until the point he was charged with first degree murder or attempted murder prior to Gabriel even passing away, he has no criminal history. He's not a violent person. He was a caring individual. You know, he was trying to be an upstanding citizen in his community. He was trying to be those things. However, the little birdie in his ear named Pearl completely 
caused him to do a 180. And he wasn't. He was no longer that these things she described. And in the time that she would have met Asario, he would not be these things. The only thing that would be true in that statement is he had no criminal history yet. She would recommend that the case be closed as there were no red flags. She would also recommend or also state that there, the risk for abuse was decreasing. Let me repeat that. The risk for abuse was decreasing. If she had done her job and not been half ass, you would have been able to see the risk wasn't decreasing, it was increasing, rapidly increasing. This little boy went from healthy and vibrant and full of life to talking about killing himself and, you know, saying that if he was gone, then maybe his mom would be happier. He just wanted his mother to be happy and he just wanted his mother to love him. You don't make that transgression at an eight-year-old level without the emotional and physical torment he was going through. But Patricia never documents this, ever. She is the senior DCFS worker on the case. She is the one having contact with the family and she is quick to absorb the story she hears so that she does not have to work any harder than what she's working. When you boil it down to nothing, that's what you're left with. She's lazy and she did not want to have to work any harder than she was already working. Kevin Baum would be the supervisor to Stephanie Rodriguez. He was head of the emergency caseworker department. Um, and when he read the claim and the findings that Stephanie had wrote up three months later, by the way, he held on to this file for three months before evaluating it, but at least he did some part of his job. We'll give him that. He did mark Gabriel's case as high risk for abuse. And that's where his job stopped. He did not recommend that Gabriel be evaluated by a medical professional. He did not strongly encourage it. He did not enforce it. Had he enforced a medical checkup from somebody when he assessed that Gabriel was at high risk for abuse, it would have been very clear that they needed to remove him from the home. There's not a judge that walks the face of this earth that would not have signed off on the warrant to remove this child from the home and remove his brothers and sisters. But Kevin stopped by simply marking the chart or marking the case as a high risk for abuse. And there his job stopped. Let me introduce you to Greg Merritt, our fourth and final DCFS worker. He has 24 years of experience working with children. That is an astronomical amount of experience that he's had in a very difficult area to live in. At any one time, he could be seeing over 280 cases of child abuse. He's got these, these social workers that are going out to each and every individual house and looking at each and every case. But he is the supervisor that is approving whether or not the work they are doing is sufficient. It is a lot of responsibility on his plate. It really is. And he felt that he should be able to trust Patricia and her findings with the amount of experience that she's had working as a social worker. He blindly took a colleague at their word. And at the end of the day, it is his job to make sure that when he signs off on closing a case, that all the paperwork is correct, where Patricia was backdating it, by the way, two weeks. She closed that case the 23rd of May and backdated it two weeks. Gabriel was beat the 22nd of May. He died the 24th. She closed the case on the 23rd and then backdated it two weeks prior. Greg 
was left with the responsibility that came from him not double checking her. And therefore, he would also be with the rest of them in doing a half ass job. I realized that we need funding in areas that have very little funding. And departments like Child Protective Services are probably one of the very first ones that see a cut in their budget. And most likely when the budget is cut, that means that they do not have the money to pay for the social workers they have on staff. And therefore, it creates a lot more work for others who are remaining. I could not imagine the amount of responsibility that goes into being a supervisor. And both Kevin Baum and Greg Merritt were simply overwhelmed and overworked. And Stephanie Rodriguez, she was undertrained. She was new. She had no business being the first person to make contact after an allegation is filed. And Patricia Clement, she probably should have found another profession the moment she realized that her colleagues did not like her. They named her as a problematic worker. She was also labeled as rude and unprofessional. At some point, you have to see that you're no longer making an impact in your career and you have to reevaluate that. I wish we could all say that we would work our dream job until the day we couldn't work anymore. But eventually the body wears down, the mind wears down. And when you're looking at things like this day in and day out, like Patricia and Greg, it's easy to overlook something. And there's a motto I have with my colleagues and it's two sets of eyes are better than one. In this case, there were two sets of eyes. There were four sets of eyes and every single one of them missed the crack that Gabriel was in. These workers would be the first in history to be charged with their role in the death of a child. Now, their role was nowhere near as serious, I guess, as Isario's, if you want to put it that way. Had they done their job correctly, there would be no need to charge Osario and Pearl with first degree murder with the special circumstance of torture because DCFS would have removed the children from the home from the start. The judge would have this to say in the preliminary hearing. These four workers represented an improper regard for human life and there was failure at every level. And I could not have said that better. He recommended that they be sent to trial. However, the four workers and their attorneys would file an appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court on the fact that they were even charged in the first place. This is something we don't see. You hear of children who are abused until they die. We hear of that. It's, an, it's not an uncommon story. However, you never hear about Child Protective Service social workers being charged because a child died at the hands of their abuser. This was a first and we were going to watch history be made and it would be known to all other employees who worked in the same manner that these four did that it's no longer tolerated because the country wants answers. We are sick and tired of watching children die and the adults in their life do nothing about it. And the judge decided these people would be made an example of. However, the appeal court in a three panel, three justice panel, sorry, would dismiss the cases and all the charges against all of DCFS workers. They would never stand trial for their role in Gabriel Fernandez's death. They faced 10 years. He was eight. He didn't even get 10 years. 10 years out of, you know, 50 is one in five. Are you really going to miss that much? And it's hard. It is so hard to know that they did a poor job, which resulted in the death of a child. And there was simply a slap on the wrist.
On July 30th of 2013, all four social workers who were part of Gabriel Fernandez's case were fired from the DCFS department. On August 18th, 2014, Gabriel's alleged child abuse is described in graphic detail to the grand jury who hand down the indictment of first degree murder with the special circumstance of torture to Asari Aguirre and Pearl Fernandez. On July 21st, 2015, the prosecutors announced they're going to seek the death penalty against Pearl and Asario for their torture of the murder of her son. Both plead not guilty. Now here, Pearl's defense team files an Atkins motion. And what an Atkins motion is, is in 2003, the U.S. Supreme Court saw a case that they eventually ruled on saying that you could not put a person with disabilities to death. However, they left a little gray area in there, allowing the states to define what disabilities stood. So Pearl's defense team wanted her tested. They wanted to see if she fell under the California state law of disabled persons, because if she did, prosecutors could not seek the death penalty in her crime. Now, this was going to slow down the trial entirely because DA's office wanted to try them together as a couple, but however, they were not willing to wait for both of the trials while Pearl be tested. So they separated them and decided to try Asario first, and that way Pearl could undergo the testing needed to be done for her to, for, for the state to decide whether or not she was disabled according to their guidelines. And then once Asario was tried, then they would try Pearl. This would later prove effective for her in her case after Asario. On January 1st, 2017, LA County Deputy Sheriff's Office disciplines all of those deputies who ever responded to Pearl and Asario's home in the eight months that Gabriel was in their care. There's a report from the family that Pearl had called the LA Sheriff's Office and had them send some deputies out. And she was telling them that Gabriel kept lying about being abused at home. And I don't know what Gabriel looked like at the time that they came out to the home and they spoke with Gabriel. I don't know what he looked like, but I'm pretty sure that it, it couldn't have been what he looked like on the night of the fatal beating because you could look at him and realize He's being abused once it got that far. However, family would say that the deputies would stick Gabriel in the back of their cruiser and give him a lecture that if he continued down this path in life, it would lead to him being arrested for lying about something that wasn't happening. And he really needed to think twice before he would tell people his mother was abusing him. So instead of these deputies standing up for this child who is being abused, they side with a very manipulative mother and instead discipline the child and make him feel even worse than he did before they got there. Well, these deputies were disciplined. On October 16th, 2017, Asario Tony Aguirre stands trial for first degree murder with the special circumstance of torture and Gabriel Fernandez's death. The prosecution has Deputy District Attorney John Hamadi and Deputy District Attorney Scott Yang. The defense counsel are made of John Allen, attorney at law, and Michael Scalar, attorney at law. Judge George Lonely presides. The final jury selection is of seven women and five men. And prosecution kicks off with their opening statements. Now, Judge Lonely, he kind of tells the jury, you know, what an opening statement is. And it's basically what it is, is the, the party stands up and they kind of give like a brief overview of what they're going to do in this trial to prove or disprove whether or not the defendant is guilty or not guilty, okay? 
So for prosecution, they have to prove there's malice and there was premeditation. Those two are, are a huge part of, of securing a guilty verdict for first degree murder. But now they also have to prove there was torture and it was intentional. And honestly, when you look at this case, you're like, how could, how could they not see it? But having to go in the, into something like that with an unbiased decision, because you do have somebody else's life in your hands, they had, a, they had their work cut out for them. The prosecution would eventually show them over 1,200 exhibits, which are different pieces of evidence that are submitted to the court to prove their allegation of murder. There would eventually be 800 pages of testimony. That's witness testimony, not the full transcript of the trial. That's testimony of the trial from the witnesses. Prosecutions had a few key points in their opening statement that I kind of wanted to share with you because honestly, I think John Hamadi and Scott Yang did a very good job grasping the jury and their attention in these first moments. Before he stood up and gave the open, John Hamadi gave the opening statement, a piece of furniture was wheeled into the courtroom and it was covered with brown paper, kind of like what you would see on like a package being shipped parcel. And you didn't know what was under it, but John would later reveal to you what was there. He would go on to say things like, quote, they only called 911 to cover up what they did, end quote. So he's saying that had there been an alternative way, they could have gotten away with it a different way. But it was really hard to explain why your eight-year-old is no longer there. And where's the body? Where's Gabriel? So instead, they were like, oh, he fell down and that'll take care of it. Of course, he didn't just fall down. Hamadi showed the jury photographs of Gabriel in those moments that he was in the hospital after that fatal beating. And again, I looked at those and I could not imagine being a juror seeing those for the first time because you're supposed to sit up there and not really react to either party more than the other. But to look at those, they're just, they tear you apart, especially if you're a mother. Well, this jury's made up of seven women. You're, you're bound to have mothers a part of that. And again, that, well, that goes back to jury selection and you know, you, you put the cards in your hand that you need to win the game and that's what the prosecution did. If we put moms up there, they might side with us a little bit better. If we put women up there, they may side with us a little bit better. So that's their way of thinking. Of course, defense is going to want to be like, no, no moms, but you can't rule them all out. And you can't say no, no women, because then you're stacking the deck in your favor. So you kind of have to give and take in the jury selection. But again, prosecution prevails again. After he shows them the pictures of what Gabriel looks like, he reveals what will be dubbed the box during this trial. And it is a cabinet, double door cabinet. And when you open the doors, they open from the inward out so that you have the entire length of the cabinet for the opening. And inside were handcuffs. And it's also covered in these little like red little arrow stickers. And what those are is to indicate that there's human blood found there. And he would explain later that when his forensic, when the county's forensic teams were in and marking evidence in the apartment, they ran out of the blood markers because there was so much blood found in that home, they had to switch to a totally different color. And so he will go on to explain, you know, this is, you know, we're at a red marker, so this is what this color stands for here. Hamadi would go on to explain the verbal and physical abuse because Gary thought he was gay. This is a huge thing. We've talked about it. We've talked about why they didn't see the hate crime um, charge. But for Asario and Pearl, that was almost their catchphrase as to why they were beating Gabriel. Hamadi would say, quote, evidence will show that the defendant is nothing more than a bully. He was a security guard who intentionally tortured and abused a helpless, 
innocent little boy, end quote. And that's exactly what he was. I think he was doing something that was bad to Gabriel, but gave him positive attention from Pearl. And we could say that Asario was the victim in his own way. He's not innocent by any means. He, he knew what he was doing. And anybody who could see two, two inches in front of their face knew what would come from this if they continued to do this day in and day out. And to sit there and say they didn't know that he was going to die is a bald-faced lie. You knew, regardless of your intellect level, you knew this could possibly kill him. You never know which thing will do it, but you have to know that eventually he won't be able to take any more. Now, the defense had a very brilliant strategy. They decided that there was no way, and there shouldn't have been, Asario admitted in interviews with the detectives that he hit Gabriel, you know, 40 something times, and some of those being the hardest he's ever hit anyone before, there's no denying he killed the child. There's none. You can't disprove he did not swing his fist and ca cause some harm that would eventually lead to the brain death that caused the family to pull him off of life support, which would result in murder. You can't say that he didn't do that. So what the defense does is they stand up and they say, you know, he's guilty of murder, but the special circumstance of the alleged torture that he intended to kill Gabriel with the infliction of torture is simply not true. They're trying to say that he didn't know what he was doing would eventually lead to Gabriel's death. But again, we're going to compare, you know, size here, four foot one, six foot two, 59 pounds, 270 pounds. You're hitting him as hard as you can hit him. You're swinging with everything you have. What did you think was going to come of that? He was going to get up and brush it off and go on about his day. Are you kidding? What? None of this makes sense, but they are his defense team and they do have a job to do. It's a hard job, but they do. And they played it in a very brilliant way. Instead of saying he did not commit the murder, they're going to say he's not that kind of person who would torture a child till they die. It probably threw the jury a little bit because when you get up and you're, you're in a murder trial, you expect one side to be like, they did it. And you expect the other side to be like, they didn't do it. But in this one, they're like, they did it, but they didn't do this part of it. So doubt, if they can, if they can put doubt in there in any way, they could save this man from the needle. And that's their job. Whether any of us like it or not, they have to do it. The prosecution would begin the trial and they would introduce witness after witness after witness after witness who would ha had some form of contact with Gabriel either during the eight months of the abuse or during the night of the fatal beating leading up to his to his death on May 24 two days later they when they started this trial prosecution was like they gr they grabbed onto the limelight and they held on with everything they had and this was this was not special in the fact that Gabriel was the first one to ever be abused and tortured. There are children every single day who are suffering abuse and torture in a home that none of us have no idea. And when we get into the defense, you'll see not everybody thought that's what was going on at home with them. But the state just grabbed onto it and they ran with it. And they ran as fast and as hard as they could. And they created witness after witness after witness. And last episode, we kind of went over, you know, what the coroner had found. So I'm not really going to go back over that information. It was hard to talk about last week. I don't want to keep reiterating those injuries. If you missed last week, I do suggest you go back and listen to it if you think you can handle it. It is descriptive and it is hard, especially if you're a parent. So, you know, be prepared. You know, listener discretion advised tremendously with that first podcast. Jurors would hear testimonial from Gabriel's teachers. They would hear from the nurses. They would hear from the 911. They would hear from first responders. They would hear from deputies. They would hear from medical staff that were there that night when Gabriel came in through the emergency room. 
in a code three, which is the highest level of emergency when entering into the hospital. Everything was ready to go when they called and said he was a level three emergency. They put, they took out all the stops. They did not know what they had coming through their doors. And when they finally got a second to breathe and, and, and think about what they saw, they could not believe the things they were saying and doing to save his life was being done to an eight-year-old child. And they had some strong quotes that came out of there that just kind of hit home. One of the nurses would say, quote, it seemed like every inch of Gabriel was bruised and swollen. He had so many injuries, it was hard to keep track of them all. He looked like a shell of a boy. This is not something you would want to hear about any child, no matter whose child. What do you mean he looked like a shell of a boy? I mean, he, he shouldn't have looked like that, but he was. He was malnourished. He was, because he was being starved and what he was eating was expired or cat litter or nothing at all. You know, they sat around and fed themselves, but they denied him the very thing he needed to grow. And then Arturo Martinez took stand. And if you'll remember, he was the security office at the Gaines office where she was going to do her welfare interview. And she had come into the lobby and checked in and he noticed that she was, you know, a tattooed up looking girl. She was intimidating. She had these kids with her and when he really got to looking at the youngest, he realized this kid's being beaten. And the more he looked at him, the more injuries he saw. He had on the back left side of his head, which was visible to Arturo, 17 to 23 cigarette marks where somebody had put their cigarette out on this child. And when they finally got called back into the office and they walked past Arturo's desk, Gabriel never said anything to him, but he did look at him and take one hand and rub the other wrist around the ligature marks that were on his wrist, showing, please look at this. Do you see this? He didn't have to say anything. Arturo says his body was saying it for him. And Pearl paraded him around knowing there was nothing anybody could do. She had everybody in her pocket as far as she was concerned. And she could have got away with it for a long, long time had Asario not lost his temper and went into a spiraling rage that caused him to beat this child to death. And Arturo's, his testimony is strong because he was a witness to a boy who had no idea who they were. He didn't know them. He didn't have access to their personal information. As a matter of fact, he testified that he had to get with somebody who did have information on them in order to even make a claim of abuse against them. And it's simply because that person's supervisor said, you're not getting in it because we're not paying you overtime. And Arturo's supervisor said, no, don't get into it. It's not your job. And he could care less. He, he knew I'm reporting this. And if it costs me my job, that's fine. If he's safe, I'm going to do this. So he did. The most damning evidence that could come from prosecution story was that of Gabriel's older brother and sister. His older brother would take the stand, who was 12 at the time of the beating, who is now 16. I am not going to give you his name. You can find it very easily on the internet. He's a minor, and in my eyes, I don't have permission to share it, and I'm not gonna. Um, but you can. I just have a real soft spot with protecting minors. And I'm going to do that in this podcast and any podcast in the future. If they are underage, unless they are the victim, I'm not going to say the name. Because they've lived through it. They watched this happen. I can imagine that their life is nowhere near what it could have been had Pearl never gotten Gabriel. Or had Pearl even loved Gabriel, you know? If she would have just loved her son, could things have been different? And these children wouldn't have to live in the spotlight of an infamous mother and her, and her boyfriend. Gabriel's brother would get up on the stand and he would be asked to recall things like his brother's abuse. And he would recall that his little brother would be hit by his mother and her boyfriend frequently. He would also be kept inside the box, which is the cabinet that we were talking about. 
that was in his was in his mother and Osario's bedroom. And they would lock him in there at night and they would lock him in there just whenever they felt like they needed to. Hamadi would ask, I noticed two beds in your room, but Gabriel still stayed in the box most of the time, right? His brother, yes. Hamadi, it's tough to remember what happened to your brother because it makes you sad. Yes. The boy would recall a Gary often calling Gabriel gay. Again, this was their, this is why I do it. This is my excuse. He's gay. No, that's not an excuse. That's your way of compartmentalizing your actions. You know they're not right. You know they're not supposed to be happening. So if I call him gay and say that I do it because he's gay, then I guess that makes it all right. I, I'm not really sure where they thought in their thought process and that's both of them have a mind I don't want to be a part of. His older brother would also testify that Aguirre would put a sock over Gabriel in Gabriel's mouth and then cover his face with, with a bandana. Now I don't it's not clear if he covered just like the bottom portion of the face or if he covered the entire face and if he covered the entire face maybe even part of it could be a way for Osario to disassociate from Gabriel. Maybe if he didn't see his face, then he didn't have to think it was Gabriel and it made it easier to do the things they were doing. And this is found a lot in people who commit violent crimes against people they know, whether it's assault or murder or, you know, rape, whatever. If they know the person, you're more likely to see that their face be covered or turned away or they were attacked from behind. This way, the person committing the act didn't have to really think that it was them. Because if I see their face, I have to know that's a little boy that I shouldn't be doing this to. But if I don't see his face, then I can, he can be anybody. It's the guy who yelled at me at the grocery store today because I asked to see his receipt. Whatever. That was his way of not having to face the fact that he was doing something horrible to a child. So Hamadi would go on to ask, Gabriel was in the box for months at a time, right? And tied up? Yes. He would also testify that Aguirre would put makeup on the boy to cover up his bruises. I think this would also just add to, add fuel to the fire as far as them thinking he's gay because haha, ha, you have makeup on, that makes you gay. You know, I had to put it on you so that I wouldn't get in trouble because you have all these bruises that I caused, but you're gay because you have makeup on. Again, just fueling this asinine excuse in their head. Gabriel would also be hidden in the box when social workers would come to the house so that they could not see him if he was injured and battered. This falls back on DCFS. Why weren't you asking where the son was? Why, why were we not actively trying to talk to him away from his tormentors? Why were you not doing your job to the fullest you could do it? I don't get it. He would be locked, hogtied, and gagged in just the next room while you sit there and listen to his mother spin you a tale of stories that you would take as the gospel and leave with. How did you miss that? The boy also testifies that his brother was being kicked, struck with the metal end of the belt, the buckle, a metal hanger, a wooden club, a baseball bat, and he was also shot in the face and groin by a BB gun by a Gary. I saw this little club thing and you can get on and you can look at it and it's got a Spanish inscription on it and I can't get an exact translation on it. But it is to the effect of the only way to get out of it is to die. And I thought that was a little eerie that that would be the thing that they used to abuse this boy. Because in the end, the only way he got away from the abuse was to die. It was awful. It's awful. The boy would say his mother kicked Gabriel on the groin, hit him with a broomstick, punched him, and forced him to wear girl clothes to school. And... If Gabriel got caught bringing his own clothes to change into once he got to school, he would be further abused by the time he got home. His mother would beat him because he didn't wear the dress all day to school. And when they finally got to go into the apartment and investigate this beating, they found two dresses in Gabriel's closet. There was no shirts, no shorts, no pants. Two dresses hung in his closet. 
The jury would also learn of a time that Pearl and Aguirre would put Gabriel in the tub and spray him in the face with pepper spray. Remember, Aguirre was a security guard for this uh, Velarda market, and I'm sure pepper spray was part of what was issued to him to perform his job. Not something he probably would have to use, and if he did, it probably was only once. So he chose to empty a can of pepper spray on the face of an eight-year-old little boy in the tub where water is right there to help alleviate, and they did nothing but laugh. There's a picture where Gabriel comes to school right towards the end of April, right at the beginning of May. They're kind of working on their Mother's Day gifts, and his face, one eye is just so red and inflamed, and you can tell there's something irritating. It just looks uncomfortable. And it would not surprise me if that's a result of the pepper spray. If any of you've ever accidentally come in contact with some or had to do some for your job or what have you, that stuff makes you leak stuff from everywhere on your face. You've got tears, you've got snot, you've got drool because your body is trying to flush that, that heat out and that's the only way it knows how. And so for Gabriel to have a red, irritated, swollen eye like he did, it would be from the massive amounts of tears he performed trying to flush that out of his face that was just being continuously sprayed back in. Gabriel's other bro older brother was asked about stuff that Gabriel had been forced to eat. He tells the jury about him having to eat spoiled or expired stuff, recanting a story where he was forced to eat old spinach, and when he vomited, on the table, Pearl and Aguirre made him eat it again. So his body's natural reaction to putting something in there that you shouldn't be eating was to vomit. And he couldn't control that. It's not, not something he would, could have held back. You're eight. You have very little control on something like that. And he was punished because that was something he didn't have control over. He was punished for it anyway. And he had to eat the vomit from the table. And this is, you know, there's several recounts of different times that Gabriel would throw up and have to eat it again. He also explained to the jury that his mother and Aguirre would force Gabriel to eat kitty litter and cat poop. Now, when the coroner's report came on and happened in episode one and we got to hear a little bit of testimony he found when he did gabriel's autopsy he found in the stomach this grain sand like texture and when it was compared to cat litter you couldn't identify the two apart they looked they were almost identical and that's all he had on his stomach there was no food it was it was well well past supper by the time he was beat in the manner he was beaten, he should have had something, but there was nothing. And your body can't process and break down and digest kitty litter. It had been two days from the time he came into the ER to the time he died, he still had kitty litter in his stomach. That had to be set so heavy and make him feel so miserable, but really there was nothing there for his body to get energy from. He just, he didn't have anything. There was no fat on him. He was, he was skin and bones for his age. During cross-examination, defense attorney Sklar asked, Why do you think Gabriel was hurt so much, but not you and your sister? How is he supposed to know that? Did they tell him? His response was, I don't know. That should not have been a question. This child went through a horrible, horrible scenario where he lost his brother to a mother who could not love him. He had been abused by his mother. He had been neglected. He had been abused when he tried to sneak Gabriel food. He was hit. Pearl hit him for trying to save his brother and beat him. He got in trouble. And cross-examination, of course, this is their job. They are supposed to try to raise doubt. But this question to a 16-year-old boy who was 12 at the time of the abuse, how is he supposed to know? Gabriel's sister would take the stand next and she would give a very hard testimony. As a matter of fact, when John Hamadi showed her a picture of Gabriel lying in the hospital bed and asked if that was her brother, she broke down and Judge Lonely 
issued a five-minute recess so that she could regain her composure. Once jury was reconvened, she would be able to confirm that, yes, that was her brother in the photograph. She would testify saying that her mother knocked out Gabriel's two front teeth. Periodically wiping her tears throughout her testimony, she'd also confirm that a Gary would shoot her brother with a BB gun. When asked if her brother was kept in the box a lot, she replied yes. She also would confirm that the handcuffs that were attached to the box were so he could not get out of it. She also testified that Gabriel was forced to wear girl, girl clothing and that the couple frequently called him gay. Her final moments on the stand was sharing the night of May 22nd, 2013, as she sat on the edge of her mother's bed and watched Aguirre beat her brother until he could not stand up. She said, quote, my mother's boyfriend punched him. He knocked the wind out of him and he fell over and he didn't get back up. So they picked him up, they threw him in the shower and they kept yelling at him to wake up. When he didn't wake up, my mother decided to call the police. Once she called the police, she would also make Gabriel's sister clean the blood from the bedroom that was everywhere from the beating. His little sister had to try and help cover up a murder while her older brother was to make up a lie to help give, you know, to help sway the, the fact that they abused him. At this point, it would be the defense's turn to start their case. And like I said before, they admitted to a Gary committing murder. They said he did it, but they didn't say he was guilty of torture. And for them, they had to prove it. And the best way to prove something like that is through character witnesses. And when looking at Osario's early life prior to Pearl, it was really hard to find anything negative about him. He had a very clean history. He didn't have, he doesn't have a previous criminal history. He's never been charged with anything prior to the murder charge. His former employer would speak very highly of him. She would call him patient and kind and caring. His sister would take the stand, confirming that he had a relatively normal childhood, that he wasn't abused. They, didn't, they weren't the richest, but they had the things they needed. And he came from a loving home. Unfortunately, Gabriel would never get to experience that love from a Gary. When the defense rests their case, closing remarks were given. The jury was sent to deliberate based on the 1,200 pieces of evidence they had and testimony that they could go back and refer to as they discussed whether to convict Osario Gary of first-degree murder with a special circumstance of torture. On November 15, 2017, the jury, made of seven women and five men, deliberated for five and a half hours over two days. Finally coming to a verdict, when read, Osario Tony Aguirre was found guilty of first-degree murder with the special circumstance of torture. On December 13, 2017, there, just prior to that, there was about a 10-day um, penalty phase trial and that's kind of where you get people to take the stand and plead that we give him life or plead that we give him death. It helps the jury really narrow down a sentence for him. And after three days of deliberation from the penalty trial, the jury voted unanimously to sentence Osario Tony Aguirre to death. It is needed when you are convicting someone or when you are sentencing someone who has been convicted of first degree murder and the DA is seeking the, the death penalty, you have to come to a, unan a unanimous decision in order for the death penalty phase to be given. And for two and a half days, the jury hung at 11 to 1. One person held out. And their conviction that they weren't really sure they were able to give take somebody's life in their hand in that manner but the jury really went back over the evidence and really kind of talked it out some more and with their final vote it was 12 to 0 for the death penalty now it's rumored that after Pearl had heard what sentence the jury had given Osario she reached out to her defense attorneys and they reached out for a plea deal 
that's not confirmed. Nobody else is really saying that. It is rumored. It's And if it happened, to me, this was Pearl's way of saying or of realizing that she was not as invincible as she felt she was. You know, she had fooled everybody. She, you know, she was a wolf in sheep's clothing and she sold it like it was her job. But when it came down to the fact if she was willing to put her life on the line, she just couldn't get behind it. So on February 24th, 2018, Pearl would accept a plea bargain from the LA County District Attorney's Office. And what was required of her was to plead guilty to first degree murder with the special circumstance of torture in exchange for life in prison without the possibility of parole. The only thing she got from that, she did not, you know, rebuke the torture. She didn't rebuke the murder. She, she simply said what she had to say to save her hide. Because she thought if they could give that to Asario, who essentially is a very nice guy prior to meeting Pearl, what, what were they going to do to Pearl? Obviously, she felt like she would also be handed the death penalty had she taken the case to trial. So February 24th, she pleads guilty. On June 7th, 2018, Judge George Lumley sentences the couple. And this is the first time since we've seen these two in the courtroom together since before the Atkins motion was filed by Pearl's defense attorneys. And neither one of them could look at the other one. Asario maintained the very slack face, didn't make eye contact with anybody, kind of head down, eyes focused towards the floor in front of the table. Well, Pearl sat at the end of the table, you know, what would be like the head of the table at a dining room table with her defense right there. And she was given an opportunity to speak at their sentencing hearing. And she had this to say, quote, I want to say I'm sorry to my family for what I did. I wish Gabriel was alive. Every day, I wish that I had made better choices. I'm sorry to my children, and I want them to know that I love them." End quote. Watching her say this is so, it's so robotic. It's like telling somebody, like telling your child to say sorry, and they turn it around and go, I'm sorry. You know, there's no heartfelt anything behind it. This was I need to say what everybody wants me to say. But when she said his name, there was no infliction. There was no reaction. There was no brief moment of remorse. There was nothing. She was lifeless with a voice. I don't believe her apology was genuine. I believe it was what she felt she needed to do. I don't feel like she meant it. Judge George Lumley would have these final remarks for the couple. Quote, I hope you think about the pain you caused to this child and that it haunts you. End quote. I could not have said it better. I hope it does. I hope you see him in your dreams. I hope he's the first thing you see when you wake up in the morning. I hope he's the last thing you see when you go to bed at night. I hope you hear his name a thousand times every single day. You shall not have peace from this. You shouldn't. You did this. You took this child from this world. And regardless of whether or not you were the parent, you had no right to do so. You know, we, we probably all heard a mother say this. I brought you into this world and I'll take you out of it. But there's not a mother who has said that that genuinely meant it. And for Pearl, if she said it, she genuinely was meaning it because she did not like her son. Simply because it was a hard pregnancy, a hard delivery, and hard laboring. She didn't want him from the moment she found out she was pregnant with him. It only took her eight years to get rid of him. Eight months in her care from him to go a bright, happy, loving, innocent child. She beat, bruised, ridiculed him until there was nothing but a shell left. And when Asario hit him harder than he ever hit anybody before, 
He took this innocent child's life and he had no right. She had no right. In California's DCFS system, they have over 300,000 cases of child abuse reported at any given time. Gabriel's case is not the first one that the system has failed in the years. Just two weeks after the trials for Gabriel's case ended, another boy, 10-year-old Anthony Alvos, had died from the injuries he sustained from his mother and her boyfriend. You may ask why is Gabriel's case different or special compared to others? And the answer is, it's not. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. Citizens had had enough and they demanded answers and justice for Gabriel beyond the two who had killed him. Unfortunately, we would not see the people who ignored the cries and signs be brought to justice. But this put others who are like them on notice. Doing a half-assed job was no longer acceptable. This may be the end of our journey with Gabriel Fernandez's case, but it's not the end of his story. I encourage you to keep up with him and keep up with the family. And if you feel like there's more that you could do to help children like Gabriel, I suggest that you contact your local agencies and see where your help could be beneficial. I want to thank you for joining me in episode two of Gabriel Fernandez's case and sticking with me as this was a difficult one to hear and as episode two was longer than normal. I will leave you with another one-liner. The important thing to remember is not to forget. Benny Bellamacina. Much love, the true crime librarian.